So, uh, welcome to this meeting, um, um, friends and colleagues. Um, we usually, at this time, meet in Frankfurt this time of the year. Um, usually, La Terza has his little stand, and we, we arrive in Frankfurt with Anna Gianluca, who's our editorial director, um, Giovanni Carletti, who's our senior editor, and Agnese Gualdrini, who's a foreign rights manager. And we meet you as you meet uh, other colleagues for, all over the world um, for the annual book fair. And during the fair, uh, as all other publishers, we look at uh, the rights list of foreign publishers. Um, we explain our titles to other colleagues in other countries. We look at proposal and some colleagues, not really La Terza, participate even to auction for announced bestseller. Uh, but all this, in fact, as we know, as you know, can be easily done during the year. Um, what really makes Frankfurt unique, I think, um, I will hear your opinion about that also, but is that in, we exchange also something which is not purely uh, linked to the title, we exchange ideas, we exchange experience about uh, books and the book market. Um, but this year, due to COVID, the pandemic, um, publishers of all the world will stay, will stay at home. I mean, in fact, Frankfurt will be uh, done by some virtual meet meetings like the one we're doing, but there will not be a physical um, meeting. And um, we'll still send around our titles, we exchange offers for foreign rights, but you know we cannot do what we are used to doing in October, meet in person. Um, and I think this um, is, a, is, a, is something we, I mean, we, we, we lack. I mean, we, we think at La Terza is something that we, we, we think um, we're missing. And this is the reason why I invited you, and, and thank you very much for um, coming to this meeting, to share ideas, particularly about what has happened, uh, uh, which is quite dramatic. Um, in, in, in our market, like in all the world and in other, in other part of the, of the, of the market, um, just you know, in a recent report of the Federation of European Publishers, it is written that the loss of sales in the two months, two months and a half of the, of the shutdown of bookshops, March and April and, and part of May was around 80%. Uh, which is uh, very big, and it is written in this report that, I quote, in none of the countries where bookstores had to close, online and digital sales compensate the loss of sales in bookshops. So we are all exposed to quite a new situation, and I think in the need, particularly this year, to, to learn from others' experience and to figure out what is the best way to react to this great problem. And this is the reason why we thought of this webinar, and I thank you for, for being here. I mean, you, um, the participant to this virtual meeting, we, we work together for uh, since many years, and you are part of companies which are, have a long history, uh, some of the most uh, distinctive, prestigious European publishers founded in the 20th century, uh, and with remarkable catalogs and long sellers. Um, I mean, I cannot obviously quote not even a, a little part of them, but just to mention some of the great names. I mean, you're the publishers of such distinguished authors as Thomas Mann, Ernst Hemingway, Marcel Proust, and non, I mean, in, in essays, Jürgen Habermas, Bruno Munari, Jacques Legoff. I mean, just to mention a few. And part of these authors are shared because we, we publish a lot of translation and, and the companies who are represented here are... Um, uh, companies who published also and, and successfully books of, of our authors of other languages. And I think we, we aim at quality, but also, this is interesting, we are all, all of us, um, particularly some of us, but all of us, I would say, pocketbook publishers. I mean, we, we look also to a, a wide audience. And, and obviously, we're not representative of all the market. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that the other publishers, distinguished and important, could, uh, would have a different point of view. Uh, but I think our point of view is it can be interesting and can have a broad view about the European market. And I think we have also a lot in common, 
but also difference, not only of nationalities, but also uh, as a consequence of the publisher we work for and the different role. And I will sh very shortly introduce you. Um, Valeria Ciompi uh, is publisher of Alianza. Uh, uh, Alianza is a very distinguished Spanish company founded in 1966. I hope the dates are right, by Jose Ortega Sportorno and based in Madrid. Um, uh, Bruno Caillet is the sales director of Madrigal Group in Paris. Madrigal is a group who um, comprehends com very prestigious companies like Gallimard, Flammarion, Casterman, and others. And in fact, the, the PDG of the Gallimard group, of the Maraval group, is Antoine Gallimard, who's the grandson of Gaston Gallimard, who founded the company in 1911. Nora Mercurio is the rights director of Surkamp another very distinguished company, uh, publishing house founded in 1950 in Frankfurt by Peter Surkamp. Now uh, Surkamp is in Berlin. And um, last but not least, Stuart Prophet is the publishing director at Penguin Press. Penguin Press was founded in 1935. I hope the date is right by Alan Lane. And is one Thank again you. of the most distinguished companies and most successful also in terms of diffusion of the book. So. I will stop here. Um, I, I think uh, the, the, in our meeting, we will try to, to have uh, more possible intervention. And, and I will start asking you to have the first intervention to stay in, in, in four or five minutes, not more, about a general view of the impact of COVID in your country on the sales of book, but also on production and promotion. Um, and how it obviously created the difference in the sales between bookshops, physical bookshops are online. Um, and then we will then speak about translation. And I hope will be a final occasion to speak about something which we could call European uh, culture. So let's start right away. And um, I will start with Valeria Ciompi, if you like. Thank you, Giuseppe. And... Uh... Thank you for this opportunity to be together and share our thoughts. Uh, and in fact, I mean, I never thought I would miss Frankfurt, but I do. I mean, and what I miss more are not the appointments, but I do miss corridors, hotel lobbies, and old informal occasions to meet colleagues and to talk and speak about apparently unimportant things, but unimportant matters are maybe the most important matters we deal with. And uh, I must say that, well, if we had answers for all your questions, Giuseppe, I think that we will solve the <laughs> world's problems. But I think it's very interesting at this point that we stop and think about these questions, maybe with no answers yet. Uh, I must say that I, I mean, I would like to, to make a statement on the fact that now more than ever, I feel very proud of our craft. I feel very lucky uh, because while most of our colleagues from creative industries are fighting, at least in Spain, a very, very dark fight in our socially distanced world, that is so detrimental for shows, for music, for theater, for opera, for museums, for travel. But fortunately, at least for the time being, not so much for books. And uh, while you were uh, speaking of catalogs and of backlists and uh, pocketbook collections, I feel fortunate. I feel very fortunate because uh, our new books, our new projects, can be both new contributions to the narrative and thought of our present world, as well as new presentations of the old-time universal culture. Our catalogs can be living museums, and I think that that is a very strong privilege nowadays that we can. Uh, we can uh, focus our creativity, creativity sorry, <laughs> also on past achievements, keeping authors and their works in print, reissuing them to attract new readers while giving space and opportunities to new creations. I think that this is something that makes me feel especially proud and lucky. 
And uh, going back to Spain, I must say that the present situation in Spain, uh, while we are facing this second wave of infection, it's, uh, I mean, we are facing it with still greater uncertainty than the first wave. And uh, leave, let's leave aside politics. But yet figures are not as disastrous as predicted by some of the more pessimistic forecasts. By the end of September, the overall decrease in sales is of 10% in value. And forecasts are now of a maximum decrease of 5% by the end of the year. Though with great uncertainties, as part of Spain is now under a partial lockdown, which we do not know how it will affect the market. Uh, and the overall economic situations, once government support and furlough schemes is coming to an end, is deteriorating quickly. So um, we had very good uh, show of solidar solidarity by good readers during the lockdown, following old initiatives by booksellers. Uh, summer has been ex extremely good in sales after the reopening of physical stores, while summer in Spain is normally a very quiet period for sales. But now uh, October has had a very poor start despite the great number of new releases, which is quite worrying. But on the other hand, I must say that Alianza Editorial, Editorial is among the lucky ones and uh, for the time being, our domestic sales are almost, and it's a big figure, almost 20% over past year sales, though temperate by the extremely difficult situation of foreign sales in Latin American market. I think that what has happened during these months, apart from the good luck that sometimes hits a publisher, and this time it has, I think that is something that deserves our attention. I would say that during the, the lockdown, um, people have, have had more time to read and they have read more, which is good. And this has represented better chances for the backlist. On the other hand, books in print have benefited from the lack of new titles being given more time on both virtual and physical shelves and have been kept selling. Uh, even good books from 2019 have kept selling steadily while normally in normal circumstances, they would have stopped their sales. Then we have had a significant growth of digital sales, which have more than doubled last year's figures. And this in a way has inspired us to make more digital editions of our classics and modern classics from our list, uh, which has been having very good results. Then uh, more than our 50, the 50% of our sales are through, through bookstores. And we have been cooperating closely with booksellers, supporting them and trying to build up a communication with readers uh, with the help of authors to strengthen the sense, the sense of community that I think it's so necessary in times of crisis. Uh, then we had a big bestseller, uh, unexpected and very risky, which has been the autobiography by Woody Allen. We launched the book uh, at the moment of the official reopening of physical bookstores and it has fueled bookstores revenues and uh, has created more and stronger links with bookstores, which has been good for all of us. Uh, once I've said that, I think that the next month will be extremely challenging. We have the menace of maybe no Christmas celebrations in Spain due to partial lockdowns, which will mean something very dangerous for book sales. And then we have to think on what to publish, when to publish it, how to reach our readers, how to make the right choices on print runs, which is something I think that needs to be thought over, and how to get 
government involved in recovery programs and how to keep uh, being proud of our craft, keeping an eye on data and yet focusing on our creative role. And that needs all of our energies, our cooperation and faith and high spirits. And I think this is all what I can say for the time being. Thank you very much, Valeria. I think you put a lot of very interesting um, subject to discuss. I would now ask Bruno Caillé to tell us about France. Okay, thank you very much, Giuseppe. Thank you, Valeria. First, uh, I would like to say that I'm not so familiar with sharing information in uh, these uh, international meetings, but as mentioned, Giuseppe, I think the situation requires it. So uh, in the period between March and May, sales have dropped by 60% in France. Uh, and then there has been a strong recovery in June, July, and August. And if we consider September year to date, sales have decreased by, I would say only 8%. And I think Valeria told in Spain it was 10%. If you look at digital sales, they have, they have really increased. There, is, there are no panels, so I will give you the Madrigal figures. And our sales have increased by at least 30% September year to date. If you consider the audiobooks, sales have tripled. So this is one of the really new trend uh, of what happened in uh, on our market. Some interesting points regarding uh, the backlist. Backlist has remained stable. I mentioned that sales have been down by 8%, but the backlist remained stable. So uh, on, the, on the contrary, new releases decreased by 16%. Madrigal is happy to have a strong backlist. Uh, so we were on, on a rather good position as regards this point. Um, An other interesting point is that sales have, the market shares of best sellers have concentrated, has been, uh, I, I would say that the, the, the best sellers, uh, top thousand books, for example, their market shares increased from 25 to 28%. So there has been a development of sales on the key books. As regards segments evolution, in France, there has been a very strong growth of educational publishing, the growth at the end by 5%, uh, and children books increased by 1% graphic and novel, uh, comics and graphic novels increase also. Uh, on the contrary, the, the sales have dropped really, it was very difficult for literature, uh, they, they decreased by 7% and human and techniques and human sciences by 15%. I think uh, Valeria mentioned this point also, publishers have delayed low and middle selling publications to 2021 to help booksellers finances to avoid um, too strong um, books coming in the booksellers uh, last point uh, the very strong uh, decrease of returns because maybe and maybe the two points are are, are linked together less new titles and less returns at the end. So these are the, the key points that I could mention. And as regards what happened in booksellers, in independent booksellers, they saw their sales increase, uh, really the, what I call the average basket, they increase really significant, significantly. Giuseppe, I, am, I finished this point. Thank you, Bruno. It's, it's very interesting. And obviously, 
your point of view as a sales director is particularly interesting and deep on the market. I think that Nora Mercurio can, uh, obviously she, she will tell us about Germany in general, but particularly interesting, I think, that Nora tells us what has happened in, in, in the exchange between uh, the publishers and the foreign rights. Surkam is a, is a very strong seller. I mean, uh, um, Surkam in the years has sold a lot of prestigious books and, and titles and authors, and I'm, I'm very keen to know what, what has happened on that side, Nora. Uh, you should, you should, uh, we don't hear you. Why don't you hear me? Fine, okay. You hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for focusing more into my direction because I felt a bit intimidated by all the numbers that were flying around. <laughs> thank you, Bruno, and thank you, Valeria. Um, well, I have some figures for you as well, but I prefer to read the whole extraordinary and frightening experience we are going through worldwide. Um, I prefer to read it in optimistic moments. So I will give you some figures, but then try to focus on some um, positive spotlights. Um, it is easy for me to say so because Germany, for reasons that have been quite discussed uh, under different perspectives has not been affected as strongly for now as many other countries by the pandemic. Uh, so we are in a lucky situation. I say for now because I'm not taking it for granted that it will last. So the situation can turn around uh, any moment and there are some experts in Germany saying that um, it's very difficult to, to, to stop this process, that it is going to turn around. But um, in spring, we have not been totally spared, but uh, it's been easier here than in other places. And Germany being a strong book market uh, anyway, and um, uh, quite healthy one, we, uh, we didn't face exactly the same losses and the same very frightening figures that have been faced in, in, in other countries. Still, the market, um, and when I say the market, I refer to the figures that, the, the official figures that were mostly based on booksellers, retailers. So I can't say what other publishers are facing exactly. I can only say what the official figures say about the book sales in general. So while in the, in the weeks between mid-March and the beginning of April, there was uh, a minus in sales of nearly 65%, we are now strongly catching up. The overall market in Germany, book market, seem to be right now at a minus of um, 6%, which is e-commerce and uh, brick and mortar together, while brick and mortar is about minus 10%. So if things continue as they did in the last two months or three months now, because it's July, August and September that has been, uh, that have been doing well. The end of the year forecast is saying that we should succeed in, in leaving this year with a blue eye of minus 3%, which would be minus 6% of the stationary bookshop. In a year like this 2020, minus 3%, um, which is a lot of money, of course, but it could be much worse. And that's what I'm hearing from many other colleagues, from many other places, that when we look back at what we feared in February or in March, we thought, April, we thought um, it's going to be a total catastrophe. And now there is some confidence that things 
if nothing really ugly happens now, things could turn out better than we anticipated. So um, that's the book sale. Um, there have been shiftings. Um, all the official reports say so. Of course, only online sales have increased. On, of course, digital sales have increased, although I should say that digital is not yet as important for us. I mean, um, we can't compensate anything through ebook sales and we can't compensate uh, through e-commerce for our retailers. I mean, the local bookshops are oh, what, is, what is making, what, those are the ones who are selling our books mainly. And the local bookshops in Germany have done um, amazingly, they have been amazingly creative. They have done an amazing job. I'm so grateful for the effort and the energy and the passion and the patience and uh, the, the time that booksellers have, um, have invested in those decisive weeks and months to, 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 to keep their customers close. The amount of, um, as I said, energy and creativity and time that went into customer care, uh, being available, being reachable, um, consultations via phone, home delivery by bike, garage selling, and whatever they, they came up with, I think it's been extraordinary. And this is one of those stories of hope and optimism that I said in the beginning. I think um, in many, um, many of us have proven to be so passionate and so into what we are doing that I thought this is really sparking optimism for all of us. Um, so as I said, it's the, it's the customer relationship that has been uh, hugely uh, taken care of. And this has been paying off in the end because um, many customers, okay, okay, that's another point in there. Um, Amazon has had delivery problems in Germany uh, in the beginning. Um, and also they weren't listing or they were not prioritizing books. And partly they weren't even listing books. So, um, of course, all of this has helped the stationary uh, bookstores. Um, also, there has been a huge media resonance concerning the, the cultural industry in general. There have been tons of articles about the theaters, about the film sector, about publishing, about all the artists, um, galleries closed and um, there has been a huge public attention on the cultural industry so musicians concert halls um, I'm sure I forgot many of them but um, so the whole in the whole cultural industry has been spotlighted by the media and um, there have been so many supporting interviews and articles by booksellers talking about the book industry now um, this has helped a lot too, and um, so in the end, I think those are aspects that we need to that we need to to be proud of and to build on. So um, that's something that I, talking about the book market as such, that I really appreciated over the last month. Of course, we had to cut some titles. No, we didn't cut; we shifted. So we have to shift some some books too. Of course, we need to to make sure that uh, the next programs are balanced. Of course, we need to. Of course, it's been very hard for some of the spring books that really were published into the pandemic because we didn't uh, we couldn't take them back. And now I'm coming to the point of the of the phone right. Um, we were just talking about backlist publishing. We know um, that uh, that you're a proud backlist publisher, and that's the same. That's the same for us. So, during uh, during the month from March to to now, basically, um, we have continued to sell phone rights 
and not even not even little of them. So we do around 450 new contracts each year. And um, by September, we usually have little, little less than half of them signed. And um, this year, it's not so much less than usual. The thing is, it's all backlist. So we, we didn't sell anything new from March to now. Very few, very few, very small sales. So what really stopped for the for the moment is um, is the the translation sales of new books, both fiction and non-fiction. So there's an increasing interest in non-fiction right now. Literature is not only difficult in in, in France for the moment; it's, uh, it seems to be difficult everywhere. But um, but it was the backlist and the classics that kept us going, and. Obviously, we had um, we won with Peter Hanske. We won the Nobel Prize uh, last um, last autumn, which is still carrying on some sales in, in some territories, and this um, this helps. But um, I remain optimistic that the whole rights trade will also start moving again from Germany to other countries and from Spain to other countries and from Italy and so on. The only thing which is from my perspective, because I'm responsible both for selling and also for handling our acquisitions. So I see all contracts that we sign, um, which is still very vivid for the moment is the acquisition side. So we keep acquiring a lot from from the Americans, from the British, from from all over the world, but um, but it's new titles. But this is not there's no um, counterpart in my selling new titles. So I hope this is going to to catch up again, and I'm I'm optimistic it will. But we will need to focus much more than before. We will need to focus what books do we actually offer, how do we offer them, what do we prepare. Um, there is going, there's so little attention right now and so little possibilities for new translation that, um, that we need to, to make um, very thoughtful decisions. But again, there are many positive uh, things going on, and I think focusing is one of those. Thank you very much, Nora. Also for reminding the, the passion of the booksellers. I think that this is very important for all of us, the role of booksellers during the pandemic and the fact that they tried to react. In fact, they were hit very severely, but they tried to, to, to make a lot of initiative to, to follow their clients. Stuart. Stuart Profit, I would be, we're all anxious to know what's the situation from your point of view. Uh, Giuseppe, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Um, you spoke in your introduction about um, European culture, which perhaps we will come on to at the end, but um, I think that um, if European culture is in your hands, it will be safe. Um, and uh, thank you very, very much for, for taking this initiative. It's so easy at a time like this for, all, for us all to hunker down and to go into our bunkers. Uh, and you have reached out to us all in the way that you do so characteristically um, and getting us to think across borders. And I, I want to pay tribute to you for not only uh, assembling us today, uh, but for all the work that you do in in uh, with each of us in getting to th getting us to think internationally, um, you're a truly European publisher, and it's a Matetsa is a truly European publishing house. You, you can and stop it here, Stuart. <laughs> I'm about to stop. I'm yeah, about thank to stop. you so much. I'm not going to spare your on, go on. I do want to. I, I think I, I I'm I'm sure I speak for all the others too in in saying this. The other thing to say is that um, I'm kind of embarrassed that we are all uh, 
speaking English, the, the language uh, of the country which has removed itself uh, so terribly from the EU. Um, and um, I'm very grateful to you all for um, speaking in my native tongue. Um, it's such a relief that I'm not trying to speak in any of your native tongues because um, I would communicate much less well. So I want to begin by echoing some of the things that um, others have said. Um, Valeria spoke about the situation of, um, and, and others have also spoken about the situation of the other creative industries. Um, and that is emphatically the case here also. For example, uh, just this morning, uh, the Royal Opera House uh, announced that it was going to sell its single most valuable movable asset, which is a painting by David Hockney of one of its former chairmen, uh, which has hung in the Opera House for 40 years, 50 years. Um, and uh, they reckon that they will be able to raise about 15 million pounds by selling this Hockney. Uh, also just announced today is that one of the main UK cinema chains is closing um, until the spring. Uh, the release of the new James Bond film has been delayed for a second time. Uh, and without big hits of this kind, the, uh, the cinema business cannot keep going. Um, and in every um, performing art, and every place where people have to gather, um, similar things are happening. So we are extremely uh, fortunate, I think, as book publishers, that we are not suffering in the same way. Um, to look at the raw data as uh, Bruno and others have, um, the UK is in a, um, a remarkable position, um, a, a better position in uh, so many ways. I, I'm not quite sure how it's come out this way. And although the data is incomplete because bookshops were closed for 12 weeks uh, between April and June, uh, so we don't have totally complete data, but it does seem that one of the things that people have done during lockdown and during this terrible period in our history is that they've gone uh, and read more um, and as far as we can tell, the UK domestic market is up um, between about six and seven percent for physical books this year so far. Um, there is that caveat that the data is not complete, um, but this is, um, this is an optimistic picture. Um, the recovery, uh, as Bruno was also saying in France in the last few weeks, has been uh, dramatic. That is, of course, um, very um, weighted towards Amazon. Um, Amazon are probably up 10% uh, this year in terms of physical sales overall. Um, I mean, they were already eating the world. and They're now going to do so even more. Uh, um, uh, and as somebody else has said, I think it was Nora, um, uh, the, the demand through Amazon is now so strong that they can't actually cope. Um, they report that it's like Christmas every year, they're saying. Um, their warehouse capacity um, has simply not been sufficient to cope with either all the orders that are going in from the publishers or from the demand that has been going out from the customers. Uh, and I think that one of the uh, results of the crisis will be that existing trends will be magnified dramatically. Um, and that is, that is certainly one of them. The move to um, online physical book sales uh, will very significantly increase. Ebook sales are also um, up dramatically. In April, they were up nearly 40%. Um, and so far as we can tell, the data, the, the data is not very um, transparent in the UK. But as far as we can tell, 
uh, overall they're up about 20 percent. Um, audio sales as in France are also uh, dramatically higher um, there's no public domain information um, but we were already in a position where some books were selling as many copies in audio as they were in paperback um, and some some of the big bestsellers um, and that is another trend that is only going to uh, be accelerated by what has been going on um, over recent months. So in the UK, um, the position is that the market is, is shifting dramatically um, along pre-existing lines, but it's accelerated, th those changes are accelerating rapidly. But at the moment, at any rate, um, it doesn't seem to be getting smaller. Um, and in these circumstances in lockdown, people have been reading at least as much as they were before. Um, it is also shifting here as elsewhere, um, patterns of purchase in bookshops. Uh, you said in your, your briefing notes, Giuseppe, um, is there a move to provincial towns and bookshops? And that is absolutely the case here. If you go into central London, uh, the, the huge shops, you can often see two or three people alone um, on the floor. They're outnumbered by the staff. Um, the city centre shops are, are still really struggling. Um, shops in more provincial towns are doing a great deal better. Um, The other, and, and um, one of the ways in which independent bookshops are trying to cope with what is going on is that there is an interesting initiative here um, announced about a month ago, the launch of uh, thebookshop.org, which is a, an independent website uh, already up and running in America, uh, where independent booksellers can have a, a page and a, a shop front online um, and people can go to those sites and buy their books from independent booksellers through that vehicle and um, the supply is done by a, the biggest UK wholesaler um, and the bookshop gets 30% of the sales value from those purchases um, compared to generally more generally about 50% um, if it's done in the usual way. Interestingly, during the crisis, um, the bookshop.org in the USA, at the beginning it had 250 booksellers on its site. Uh, it now has about 850. Uh, and this seems to be a rapidly growing um, channel of bookselling in the USA. Um, like uh, Nora, uh, we find that um, buying books has absolutely not diminished. Um, as we were all getting used to working at home and conducting virtual meetings, uh, suddenly the authors uh, were all at home also tapping out their outlines and um, a great flood of material arrived over the summer. Um, and we found ourselves having these long extended uh, online meetings to discuss the huge, the huge number of submissions. Um, uh, authors completing books, uh, writing outlines. Um, one of our major popular historians who I think should probably remain nameless is delivering his new book um, a whole year early. Um, and he said rather tastelessly to me the other day, he said, I think I'm, I'm going to dedicate it to coronavirus. <laughs> um, but authors are not having to uh, go out and give talks, or at least if they give talks, they're not online. Uh, they're, they're not in person, they're online. They don't have to travel and give speeches at conferences. Um, they're at home writing their books. Uh, so I think this has been, um, this has been another big effect. Um, 
and I must stop shortly. We must move on to other questions. Um, I think one of the effects of the absence of people going into particularly big city center shops is that paperbacks have suffered. Um, if you rely for your reading on seeing a big table of paperbacks and thinking, oh, I'll have those two and those three, um, that opportunity is, is much less. Um, paperbacks sell less well on Amazon, as we know. Um, so I think paperback publishing is going to need some refreshment. Um, lots of books moved out of the second quarter into the third and fourth quarters. So we're now facing a big digestion problem. That's also something that's going on at the moment. Um, and the other thing that we might talk about um, that nobody's touched on as far as one of the not of this year, uh, certainly in the UK, which was the Black Lives Matter um, moment, longer than a moment, which has um, not only had a dramatic effect on the kinds of books, or some of the books that people are reading, um, but also in the way that we um, conduct ourselves and think about who we are publishing for um, and who we are publishing with. Um, so perhaps that's a topic that we can pick up later in the discussion, but I, I will leave it there for now. Thank you, Stuart. No. Uh, just say if uh, you all put forward a lot of very interesting subjects. I just uh, say a few words before going to the second round about Italy. Italy um, has shut bookshops um, uh, from the 12th of March to formally, I mean, uh, the, the middle of April. In fact, a uh, bookshop has been shut uh, until the, the, the half of May, particularly in the north which you know has been more affected by COVID in big cities like Milan and Turin. And in th this period, the sales have dramatically fallen and, and little part have been compensated by the online sales. Um, as Nora said, also in Italy, uh, we had wonderful initiative by book booksellers, particularly one called Libri da Asporto, which literally makes takeaway books. Um, uh, independent uh, booksellers have delivered books to their client. And I think this is one of the reasons why the clients rewarded them when it was reopened and they st stayed loyal to these independent bookshops and, and kept going the bookshops. Um, as you said, in Italy also, the vast majority of publishers have shifted their production to next year. In, in, in our company, in La Terza, we postpone about 20% of the books to next year. But we, we decided we want to keep the stronger commercial title who were meant to be published. And the result was very good. I mean, we're selling them at a path uh, which is comparable with, um, with uh, the past. I just want to mention, maybe you want to take it over. We've strongly uh, enhanced the promotion online. We made new experiences of promotion through the web in uh, social like Instagram or Facebook. Um, which was very, were very successful. We did conversation, for instance, with our editors and the authors, direct conversation about their books on, on other subjects. And we had, you know, very good results. Um, in actually, the statistics uh, for what they, they're um, valid, they say that people in Italy during the lockdown didn't read more, didn't read more. Um, they, they were very confused. They looked a lot of television. They went to the web but they didn't have the concentration to read a book. So apparently um, the, 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 read, the person started to read more uh, after the lockdown. Um, it, it wasn't during the lockdown that you had you know, more people. Obviously one can discuss, but surely the bestseller list has been affected by the lockdown. I mean, there are not only new books or books like Spillover by Quanbin, but also classic books. You were referring about classical in Italy, as I suspect also in France and other countries, The Plague, La Peste by Albert Camus, which in fact is published originally, was published originally by Gallimard, but also big success, I think, Stuart in Pe for Penguin and other publishers was uh, yes, yes. A, a bestseller. 
And um, what happened, interestingly, is that when the lockdown finished in May, the forecast of publishers and of the association of publishers uh, was that we would lose at the end of the year at minimum a 20%. And it was based on the idea that at the best, we could recuperate the same turnover as last year in the, the next month. Uh, at the best, because we also feared that people getting poorer because of the crisis would spend less in books. So we felt that we were optimistic thinking that we would make the same turnover. So the, the forecast was 20%. At the end of July, before summer, the, 20, the, the forecast was uh, already much better and was around 10%. And now, as you said, and it's interesting because I think uh, there's a strong coincidence, uh, it's rather le less 5%. And I suspect we may get at the end of the year to very near to last year's result, which is quite in incredible compared to what we were thinking. Obviously, this is strongly due to Amazon. Uh, I, I would ask you afterwards, if you have the dates, I mean, in Italy, Amazon at the moment is 40% of the market. Um, it, it, is, it, was, it has rise to 48, 50%, and probably will go down at the end of the year, but still it's much more than the 25% used to be last year. So Amazon are online sales, which are 90% are being made by Amazon in Italy. There's not strong competition. I think it's very interesting what Stuart mentioned about the initiative of the, uh, of the English and American booksellers. Um, also, publishers have done a lot of, in smart working. That was also interesting. All publishers did smart working and, and, and discovered the smart working is not so bad. I mean, in fact, um, a lot of our, the things we do can be done in smart working, even if I must say that our experience in the publishing house was that there's part of our me meeting, continuous meeting. Uh, we are small, we are you know, not many people, so we can meet often during the day. This cannot be replaced. So, um, I mean, I will not comment all the things you've said, which I think are very interesting. And, um, and uh, what Stuart said at the end was interesting about the authors working more, <laughs> having more time to work. And this happened also uh, for us. Um, and I think uh, a lot of the things you've said were interesting um, and, and I think we can retake it. So I will ask you for a second round, possibly with shorter, answers um, about what you heard about the changes that we experienced and about what we can do and if we, we should do something to keep the diversity in the market because obviously the risk I think um, is that we are going to uh, a situation which a single actor in the market uh, Amazon uh, has such a big share that it can uh, influence uh, all of us and I think up, up to a certain point, it's not a problem. Amazon is very efficient. Uh, Amazon sells quite a lot catalog and we all say what is the importance of backlist. But uh, over a certain point, it's also a problem of this actor being rather anonymous. I don't know the situation in your country, but in our country, uh, it's difficult to discuss. There's no Mr. Amazon. There's a, there's a group of people. They tend to tell you what you should do. And so it's not an easy interaction. Um, I, I think Amazon has a lot of, of benefits for us, but also we should all work to keep um, a, a number of, of bookshops. I remember in January of this year, somebody that you all know, James Don't, director of Waterstone, um, a very big chain, and is changing Waterstone quite a lot, said bookshops, booksellers should um, invest not so much on discount, but on display. Uh, on the fact that every day a bookseller should change this place, should work on this place to, to make it attractive and make the booksellers a social place, a place where people can gather, uh, can meet, have experiences. And I think this is uh, an interesting um, uh, fact in which I would like you to comment because I think this is a frontier to keep this diversity in, in, in bookselling. And I would reverse maybe and start with Stuart this time. Uh, take take away your your silence, Stuart. You should. Um, James Daunt is a very innovative bookseller, 
um, and has transformed the Waterstones chain, which I didn't say anything about um, first time round. It's the um, it's the biggest, it's the only national chain remaining in the UK. Um, they suffered very badly from April to July. Their online sales were up um, 25 percent, 30 percent, but it wasn't nearly enough to compensate for the fall in um, high street sales. But they have been brilliant at um, developing events uh, within their shops. The other aspect of this that we might talk about um, is that the means for promoting books have changed. Um, a lot of it still relies on um, the traditional review coverage that remains very powerful in the UK, features and interviews with authors. Um, the main thing that has changed is that uh, events uh, almost entirely now take place um, online. And having thought that this was a much less satisfactory way of um, seeing and listening to authors, people are now really used to it. Um, and you don't sell uh, books in a book queue afterwards, um, but there is strong evidence that uh, people do go and buy books online as a result. And now that the systems are up and running and the, um, the habit is, uh, is there, many of the online events are gaining uh, huge audiences in the way that um, they, a, a merely physical event could never have done. Um, two authors that we've published this year who have given many, many talks um, online to huge audiences are Anne Applebaum um, and Michael Sandel. Um, and their books have, I think, really thrived as a result. And they've been able to talk uh, to many more people than they would have been able to usually um, when one of their books is published. The other aspect about this just worth thinking about is that um, book festivals have also changed. Um, one of the, the main UK festivals uh, every year is the Hay uh, Book Festival, which I always usually attend. Um, in recent years, their numbers have grown to about 250,000 attendees. This year, uh, the very entrepreneurial director of the festival, Peter Florence, moved the whole thing rapidly online at the end of May and had half a million attendees, um, most of them not paying anything, that's certainly true, but people going and listening to the authors and buying the books um, as a result. Um, and I think this is another of the ways in which pre-existing trends are going to be accelerated by what, is, what has happened. Uh, we probably will find authors uh, flying around the world to speak um, much less or much less than they have before uh, and people getting used to the idea of listening to somebody uh, and very often paying for somebody to come uh, and speak to them on the screen in their um, sitting room. So I think this is just one of the ways um, in which the crisis will have a long lasting effect. Thank you. Um, Nora, um, what, what, from your point of view, what, what has changed will you, you feel will stay? And, and particularly uh, thinking of bookshops, I mean, also in Germany, there's big chains, but there's also uh, independent bookshops. And, and in the center of the town, as it happened as in England, in Italy and other, that city centers shops have suffered more than local bookstores. I think in Germany, the distinction between the booksellers that have suffered more than others was um, particularly between chain and independent booksellers, because um, while the bookshops, I mean, 
German as a federal state system, we didn't have a regulation that was adapted to all states at the same time. I mean, yes, some of the like uh, social distancing and wearing mask uh, rules were the same all over the country, but um, curfews and shop closure were different uh, from state to state. So for example, in Berlin, booksellers didn't need to close. They were um, recognized as relevant to the system, while in other, in other states they had to close. Um, so what happened in Berlin, for example, was booksellers could remain open, but the chains that are made, uh, mostly um, located in the malls, they, they were closed because the malls were closed. The booksellers could have had opened, could have opened, but they couldn't because the, the, the structure where they were based was closed. So um, as I said before, there was a huge returning from the customers to their local neighborhood bookstore. And that was both through in the cities as in the more rural areas. Um, maybe in the rural areas, the bond between reader and bookshop was closer anyway. But um, I think the whole the whole initiatives that the booksellers invented really paid off, made them more visible, made them more attractive. Because we should not forget how much. I mean, Stuart just talked about um, how much the readers need or crave the author to hear him, to hear the author or her about her book, um, but. Uh, the reader, many readers also need consultation or want consultation. So, and that's something that the online um, sellers, of course, the algorithms work towards uh, ever finer um, suggestions. And it's surely no, um, no comparison between what you are suggested nowadays and how the results were like 10 years ago. But um, Still, it's not the same as talking to someone. And com compared to what Valeria said in the beginning, our meetings, the Frankfurt meetings, there is, um, it's the unexpected in a discussion that really sparks and that makes things happen. It's, it's the unexpected that you discover when you talk to, to someone about something. And that's the same when a reader talks to a bookseller. So a good bookseller can really recommend something that you were not exactly looking for or that you didn't yet know you were looking for. And that's what is, from my point of view or from what I witnessed is happening right now. People rediscover this pleasure of having a discussion with a bookseller and being recommending they didn't know they were looking for. So, and that is uh, happening on various ways. It's happening through social media, it's happening through through, um, through the publishers' websites, because publishers as well, we are offering much more um, creative and different uh, content for our readers. I mean, we are all trying to reach our readers in, in new ways. And that is something that I think is going to last. Not just the, the, the loyalty be between reader and bookseller, local bookseller, but also the way that we try with creativity to reach our audience. Thank you, very interesting. I would ask um, Bruno Caillet on two things. One, um, generally to comment what is here about particularly the, the role of booksellers and selling through internet. But the other more specific, um, will the, will the uh, internet change also in the relation between publishers and booksellers. I mean, is it possible that we'll do more and more promotion of the books through the web and not through physical meetings between publishers or and, 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 and booksellers? Um, I, I will start with this point and then I will be back on the, the role of booksellers. I think that, uh, yes, of course, we are changing the way we are speaking with booksellers and it's been now at least two or three months that our representatives, our publishers uh, are trying to give the programs 
through uh, our tools and the the meetings uh, are very we have a few meetings only physical meetings so most of the business is now done through um, th thanks to uh, uh, internet videos uh, presentations uh, but in my mind uh, this is not an a good situation uh, internet and we can make a lot of efforts for example for me it's very difficult today to express what i'm thinking what i'm feeling uh, because th there is a war between us and it's the same when you speak with uh, booksellers and when author speaks with booksellers it's very difficult so for me it's we are compelled we are obliged to do so but i hope it will stop one day uh, because it's a way <clears throat> um, you, you can't give the complete picture of a book when you when you use this tool only so uh, yes for me we had to change and i hope it will change also it will stop one day i, I expect it will stop one day the second point uh, nora nora spoke about the importance of booksellers we have a, a real chance in france to have a very strong uh, network of booksellers uh, thanks to what is called the prix unique du livre the, the fact that publishers are fixing the price of books it has made it possible in france to keep a very strong uh, bookseller network and when i hear the what represents amazon's or online sales uh, in other countries in france it must represent between 15 and 20 percent only so uh, if we are able to keep these booksellers in good health in financial good health uh, things should start again and of course on sales will keep on growing but it will keep on growing on a steady uh, uh, figure but not it will not be dramatic uh, I, I would like to mention on that specific point uh, the french government gave a huge help to booksellers thanks to uh, uh, th there is a plan of around 50 million euros to help them uh, be able to to face uh, the fact that they, they lost customers that they they will probably lose, lose money uh, at the end of the year uh, so for us this diversity uh, is very important and i will also uh, uh, go in the same direction that stuart as regards the chains we have we are lucky to have in france chains like fnac uh, strong chains they are selling a lot of uh, the book or not only books but also music uh, video and so on it's important that these uh, strong chains remain in good health uh, otherwise uh, that, that we, we will lack a way to launch books these chains are very helpful to launch authors and bestsellers uh, the, the book the the traditional booksellers network is important but not as much as these chains when you launch uh, your book, your uh, your bestseller, uh, and uh, the Fnac, for example, has uh, twenty five percent less customer. This this explains why in the center of the cities, and it's also a point that uh, I think uh, everybody mentioned. Uh, we have uh, very uh, empty uh, book uh, shops or uh, um, or, or uh, chains. Uh, in Paris or in in Lyon or in Marseille, the and and it's a, a real issue for the for the coming for the coming weeks and maybe at the end of the year and it's a very important moment for book industry. I hope uh, people will uh, we will be uh, it will be possible for this chance to uh, to uh, receive a lot of customers. Otherwise, the end of the year. Even if I agree with the, we expect maybe five percent less than last year at the end of the year. But if this end of the year uh, is uh, uh, an issue for that point, uh, it will be difficult. Thank you very much, Bruno. And um, I would uh, ask Valeria for the difficult task to comment, um, but also start the new. Uh, 
the new, the last question, tackle the last question, which is concerning European culture. Um, I think we all agree with what Bruno said. I think we want diversity, not in the sense that we all want, want a, a world with only small bookshop. We want a world with online sales, with big um, booksellers, with big bookshops and little bookshops. Uh, we want idiosyncratic uh, bookshops and booksellers, um, a specialized one and, and general one. We want uh, a, a place where people can choose because the fundamental, I think, uh, idea of freedom is, is, is to be uh, free to choose in what sort of place you would like to go and buy what sort of books you want. Um, um, and I think uh, Nora said a very in, important thing, the unexpected. We want people to, you know, make surprise and enter a place where they couldn't imagine something and they find something. Uh, they want to buy a book and then they buy another also and so on. Um, so I want you, uh, Valeria, to, to comment, but also start uh, tackling the, the final issue, which is, I mentioned to you uh, at the beginning, which is concerning European culture, because I think that the work we do uh, has to uh, has to do with exchanges and exchanges uh, are a contribution of mutual understanding and solidarity. I mean, Europe has passed a very difficult times uh, with pandemic. At the beginning, uh, really, the impression we all had is that every country was going on its own, um, uh, caring only for the nationality and in Italy, maybe in other country, even divided between north and south, different regions and so on. Okay. But through discussion, through conflict, through public debate, we arrived to a quite strong form of investment in our common future. I mean, um, the recovery fund is not only a big sum of money that all the countries, all European countries decided they want to put uh, on the benefit of everybody, but it's also in a way a strong link to uh, common policy in the future, because obviously we are creating the condition that will make inevitable to have some sort of fiscal policy, which is something with Europe didn't, you know, at the moment have. And, and, and political union uh, is, at my advice, uh, very difficult if you don't have a common culture. It's very difficult if you don't have a shared um, uh, uh, culture, which doesn't mean that we will be all the same. I mean, as in Spain, there's different part of Spain who are very different uh, cultures uh, in every country. I mean, in every uh, of our countries, there's difference. But this didn't impede uh, a process of na na nation building. So maybe we'll, we don't want Europe as, to, as a traditional nation, but we, we may, uh, everybody, I mean, in our world, can have a contribution to this. And um, if we look at the bestseller list, we see that um, even if translation in Europe have, have gone up, and I will ask Nora to confirm, but in the last years, we translate quite a lot of books. But still, if we go to the bestseller list, the bestsellers are still quite national. I mean, with few exceptions, we are proud as Italian to be the, the place where uh, Elena Ferrante has published uh, the, a, a huge international bestseller, and I, I could quote a lot of best-selling titles of others, but on the whole, there's still the majority of the bestsellers are national. And maybe we can do something to share more at popular level, um, books and culture. And I think this is something which we should, we should discuss, and maybe we should be make um, also the press more aware, because I think um, Nora said another thing which I'm grateful. She said we had a wonderful media coverage about uh, the importance of culture. And I think she's absolutely right in Italy also. Uh, but with the media, we should make more, I think, to make possible sh sharing a European culture. And I think we can do. Uh, what is your opinion, Valeria? What a difficult question. I think that Nora has given us the perfect headline, keep the unexpected happening. <laughs> I mean, I think it's great. Well, um, I must say something. I wanted to say just a little thing about Amazon. Uh, Amazon in Spain in this, during these months has become more and more important. 
but they do not take risks. Uh, they're financially successful, but not so good at keeping books in stock, which is something that we have experienced. So I think that I want to stress uh, the importance of bookstores uh, because, I mean, we have to do everything, anything in our power to, to protect them, to support them and to work with them. And we've had beautiful initiatives in Spain too, and in Madrid, for instance, signatures in streets, since uh, people could not gather in, in, uh, in the bookstores. And we saw Almudena Grandes in uh, a small street of Madrid with a small table and with a long line of people keeping the safety distance and waiting to sign her books. I mean, I think that's wonderful. Then, uh, before going into European culture, I, I mean, the same phenomenon has happened in Spain that book center, I mean, the center of cities are empty. And that makes me think of something general. What have we done to our city centers? I mean, we have uh, made them just a place for tourists or for uh, travelers from other parts of the countries. And when this stops, the center of the cities, for instance, the center of Madrid is dead. Um, I don't know, maybe this is, something, this is something we should think about. I mean, there were local music stores and luthiers and tailors and traditional stores. Now they're just, um, they're just uh, souvenir stores or chain stores. And it's absolutely empty and not working, and I don't know what the future will be. Then, uh, going to European culture, I must say, I'm afraid that uh, the confinement and lockdown has empowered more local authors, because now that, um, I mean, it's so, it's so difficult to have foreign authors traveling for tournees or for presentations, local authors have become a very good asset also for booksellers. I mean, they can talk to readers even online and they speak the same language. So I really don't know because it's true that we need to keep this diversity, which is also threatened by another thing. I mean, all publishers have been deferring launches of books and uh, it's true that most of our programs for 2021 are full of books coming from this year. And we try to, con try to concentrate on the big books because it's so difficult to communicate at this time that we try to concentrate on big names and big books. And probably we are going against that diversity. And that is something that worries me a lot, but what can we do together? I mean, I know that it's so difficult to work on, uh, on projects. I mean, we, we translate a lot in Spain, but it's true that it's always more and more difficult to, to promote foreign authors. Um, I think that at some of the first we were discussing, I don't know, some stupid idea, like uh, why don't we and you know, I know, Giuseppe, that you have been working on some of these projects. I mean, trying to make common projects among different European authors and have a global launch of an author in different European countries at the same time, and maybe benefiting of the promotion in other countries. Otherwise, I mean, of course, exchanges are important, but I'm afraid that this is a time in which we know that solutions to the present situation cannot come just from our own countries, but on the other on the other hand, we are focusing on our culture and what on what is happening in our countries. So I'm sorry, I have no good answer for your question. No, but I mean, we are publishers of authors who criticize. So it's good that we see also the problems. We don't want just to have wishful thinking. Thank you, thank you, Valeria. Bruno, I want to also ask you to comment what you've heard and add about uh, the possibility of a European culture. I, I think 
um, uh, the, the, the fact that the publishers are open to uh, translating and, 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 and promoting their authors in, in other countries and doing co-editions sometimes is, do you think it could be important, is worthwhile? Uh, maybe I'm uh, a little naive, but I have the feeling that this European culture is already existing. Um, if I consider the number of books in um, in uh, selection in price selections, for example, you have um, this part of uh, for, of uh, uh, literature coming from uh, abroad in Europe. With it's true that there is a strong influence of the U.S. also uh, publishers, but. Uh, my, my, in my opinion, this uh, European culture is already there, and it's the way booksellers are organized, uh, with a large, uh, large place left to uh, translations. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, what is happening as regards the increase or decrease of translations between our countries, but uh, in my in my opinion, and when I see uh, what is happening uh, in the in the in the programs. Uh, I've not, I think we are more and more growing European. So Giuseppe, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't say very much more. Uh, I know it's difficult on the other hand for French authors to be published in England or in other, in the States or in other countries. And this is, uh, this is I regret it. But in the other side, uh, I have the feeling that France is uh, a country where European authors have a real uh, possibility to be translated uh, and maybe it should be uh, more the same in other countries but only honestly i'm not very in in very good position to speak about this very point um thank you bruno no but i think what you're saying is very good together with what valeria has said so in, in a way, we're discussing about something which already exists, and probably we're discussing about getting it more strong. Um, I think Nora can put a very specific perspective on this, speaking about European culture. I would ask Nora something that's very much related with the work she does. Um, in the last years, Nora, from your point of view, from your observatory, Surkam, but probably, um, how have the European, generally speaking, um, related with the other parts of the world. I mean, I think that you've, you've been selling rights more in other, in other countries in the world. Other countries have been buying uh, a lot from, from in, in English authors, but also German, French, and so on. And what about internal relation? What, what are the countries that you've sold better in Europe? Uh, well, I mean, how, from your point of view, this building of European culture can be seen through this buying and selling of rights. Uh, we don't hear you. Uh, Nora, we don't, we don't hear you. Apologies. Um, first, I wanted to say that I, I, I don't fully agree on what you said in the beginning, that we should, that we need a, a common European culture or Maybe I think we need um, I think we need a common curiosity versus versus all the other cultures around us because um, what I what I would like to see most is um, the the openness the open mindedness of of uh, uh, Americans. Um, Asians, uh, so many other places in the world that they want to know what is happening in Europe and that and then on the other side, I would like to see European politics answer this curiosity with funding, with instruments that help increase the sale of rights, because I think one of the most powerful instruments that we have in um, in building bridges to other cultures are translations. Actually, it's the exchange of um, of ideas. It's the it's the ex it's the selling of translation rights that is making a difference. I mean, if I succeed in selling um, 
uh, Jürgen Habermas in many countries, then many people in those countries will understand what a major German thinker who has also shaped Germany in, in many ways um, is, is writing and thinking. And this is true for, for all of our writers, for all of our thinkers, philosophers, sociologists, artists, uh, fiction writers, and so on. So I would like to see on the one hand more, as I said, curiosity and openness towards the other, and on our side, more help in transporting those writers and books and ideas. And um, as Bruno said, I mean, we, I think France and Germany are both acquiring a lot. So we publish many authors from all around the world. Um, probably from my perspective, more than most um, Italian publishers or Spanish, um, let alone American and British, although Stuart, you might tell, uh, tell me otherwise, but I think in Great Britain or in, in the UK, there are much more translations than in America. So, um, but it's unbalanced anyway. So we sell much less than what we acquire. So in Germany, you can have a quite um, intense knowledge about what is happening in other places. I don't know how, um, how intense your knowledge can be about Germany when you are in another place. I mean, in France, yes. Um, in America, less. So, and that's, um, that's something that, that I would really um, favor if there was more support from, you talked about the recovery fund. So there should be more money for translation subsidies and funding in order to, to, to have a better understanding within Europe, but also a better understanding of European thinking as a whole in the rest of the world and vice versa. I mean, this year, just one example and then I'll stop. This year we published the first living Chinese philosopher we have ever published in our huge philosophy list. It's the first. I mean, there must be more interesting Chinese philosophers, but that's the first we published. And it, there was funding involved, there was knowledge involved, there was, um, it, and the book went really well. So that's something we are still, although we, we publish a lot in translation, that's still something to explore um, and, uh, and to, to grow. Thank you, Nora. I think you, you pointed out one single very uh, concrete, very specific thing we could all ask which is rise funds for translation. Yes. Uh, in Italy, the situation is very bad. And it's, it's amazing for me that a German says this because we consider Germany heaven from this point of view. Internationalis, we consider a model, you know, we consider in the years. In Italy, the funding of translation has been very, very, very little and done with criteria that nobody understands. Nobody understands why they give money to a certain, uh, for a certain publication, not for another. So I think this is a crucial point. In the recovery fund, we should, we should ask to have much more money for translation. And I think this is crucial. Uh, uh, it's a very simple way. Um, I, would, I would like to end our conversation with Stuart Prophet, um, thanking him particularly for having recall the engagement of La Terza in Europe. I mean, as you know, since many years, La Terza translated a lot. I mean, some of our most prestigious authors are Habermas, you just mentioned, but there's a number of historian philosophers um, uh, who were best-selling. The last one was um, uh, uh, Bauman, uh, who is our best-selling author. And, um, and then we started doing co-editions. Um, I remember uh, when you speaking about China, uh, when the Chinese translated the history of women that we've done in five volumes with two French directors, so La Terza asked George Duby and Michel Perrault to do a five volumes history 
then it was translated in China. And I, I was quite uh, shocked. I mean, I, I didn't understand. And they said, right, you know, the Chinese know Europe quite a lot. You are ignorant about China, but we know you. Um, and after co-edition that we did with a number of European publishers, we did uh, um, a collection which was called The Making of Europe with a great historian that I like to re recall. It's published by a number of, of you, which is Jacques Legoff. And the idea there was to uh, promote titles together towards authors, which is something that, I mean, a number of you have done and we are doing more and more, not only translating, but conceiving a book together. And, and the last thing we've done are, um, is the a review that we tried to do uh, some years ago called Utopia, gathering together a number of uh, uh, publishers, and in this case also prestigious academic institution. We have the London School of Economics, Sciences Po in France, the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, trying to do a network um, uh, discussing European questions and problems. And it was interesting because um, we had a number of authors who, who write for the review completely free without uh, you know, expecting any compensation. I mean, we, we, uh, the, the review was free and we asked people to write free. And so I, I really touched in hand how many uh, people are interested in building this um, European culture which obviously is a culture done on absolute freedom and conflict of ideas. We don't have any fixed or common idea about what has to be done, but it's, it's more we, sh we, we, we discuss the ideas and richer everybody gets. And I think this is a, a one of these ideas which we also do to the uh, 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 Anglo-Saxon thought. So the best possible person to, to end our conversation is Stuart. And obviously, as he said, at the beginning, um, we we are very we all of us I think are very sad about Brexit, and we will not go into discussion. Obviously, it's not the right place, but we feel that Brexit uh, doesn't uh, at all uh, uh, reduce the importance which had always been between the in the exchange between the Anglo-Saxon and the English culture and the European one and continental one. And each of us has made this experience. So I think Stuart is the right person to make some final comments about anything you want to say, but particularly about this idea uh, about feeling European by culture, not just by institution or by economics. Giuseppe, thank you. Um, before I do that, I just want to revert to something that Bruno said um, a moment ago about links with booksellers um, and how we sell books. Um, that the virtual meeting is not as good as the face-to-face -face meeting. And I think that this applies to the whole, we haven't talked much about our internal cultures, um, but I think this applies very much to the way in which we run our publishing houses and interact with our colleagues. Um, everything takes much longer. We have managed to keep the whole show on the road. Um, but I do think that in our old established publishing houses where we have been, where we work with colleagues that we've been working with for many years, um, we are living off our creative capital as colleagues and that has sustained us through this very difficult time, but it won't sustain us forever. And I think it is a reminder, as you said at the beginning, Giuseppe, um, of the importance of meeting in person. Um, there is nothing uh, that will replace that in the end, um, both within our organizations and as a group of international publishers, which is why we can do this for one year. Um, but I do so fervently pray that we're not doing it for more than one year, because I think that human contact uh, is so vital to all of us uh, in sustaining our energy and our creativity. I come to your, your question about uh, the creation of a, of a European culture. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, reflections that I have is the famous remark of uh, Deseglio um, after the Risorgimento, where he, he famously said, um, now we have made Italy, um, now we have to make Italians. Um, and if I'm, if I'm right in my interpretation of Italian history over the past 150 years, um, 
uh, that is still an ongoing process. Um, Italy is still um, very much a, a country of, of regions, uh, as of course, uh, particularly Germany is. Um, and I suspect that the process of making Europeans um, will still be going, uh, will still be taking place in, in 150 years time. Um, so I think insofar as that does happen, it's a very, very long process. Um, and it requires uh, above all leadership, political leadership and cultural leadership. Um, and in most of our, many of our countries at the moment, I think notably accepting Germany, um, political leadership is, is sadly lacking. But I also want to remember another um, remark that has stayed with me um, for many decades of the, the great journalist, lexicographer, um, man of letters, uh, Samuel Johnson, arguably the, the greatest English man of letters, uh, who said the chief glory of every people arises from its authors. Um, and we started a nonfiction prize in this country named the Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction books. Um, and we had that printed on the front of the menu uh, for every, every one of the presentation dinners. I think the main thing that each of us has to do is maintain our faith in the power of literature and the power of words um, and to continue to believe that we can propagate that, to continue to meet and exchange, um, to say what is going on in our own countries and to take, as somebody said a moment ago, to maintain our curiosity um, and our faith in the power of books um, and ideas and literature to change lives and to benefit all our lives in the way that each of us has experience, which is why we are, are, are working um, in, the, in this business and uh, working as we do. Um, so I want to come back at the end to thank you again, Giuseppe, for convening us, um, because it is the it is the exchange of ideas um, within our own beliefs and knowledge um, that I think is going to do more to um, sustain European culture. We have one field, of course, there are many others uh, than anything else, but the constant exchange of ideas um, is the thing I think that will sustain us um, in a, a difficult time like this. So thank you very, very much once more um, on behalf of us all. Well, I think we, we, we couldn't uh, close our meeting better than on with these words by Stuart. I mentioned before Zygmunt Bauman. Zygmunt Bauman has wrote extensively on Europe and said also, always that if one thing characterizes Europe is diversity, is openness, to different cultures is a place where exchange, commercial exchange, but also cultural exchange has always been with conflict because it's not peaceful always, but you know, uh, open to diversity. And I think it, what you said is believing in words and, and in ideas. The ideas change the world. Um, sometimes we, we uh, risk to forget, forget this. And, and, and I think the publishers testify every day with their work. Um, I must say, on one thing, I have some doubt after our conversation, because in principle, I agree with you that meeting in person is always better, but this meeting was so good, was so good, that maybe sometimes we could even decide, even when we have a, a, a vaccine and we can meet again in Frankfurt, which we hope that we can do this again. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody, and uh, I hope really, as we all uh, uh, hope not only to meet in, in, in Frankfurt, always, uh, obviously, but also in Berlin and go to meet Nora in London and go to meet Stuart in Madrid and go to meet uh, <laughs> Valeria and obviously Paris. So uh, because we, live, we have the, the, the fortune to live in such beautiful cities, I hope we will do a tour. 
I hope you will meet me in Paris, Giuseppe. And, and obviously, we, all, we are all welcome in La Terza, in Bari uh, and Rome. Fine. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank very you. Very happy. Very happy.